Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week I'm going back through the centuries with Belgian writer Regula Yuswin to explore the rich history of the food from her homeland. If you want to go back uh, far enough in history, you'll see that all the sweet things are always, always connected to feasting and to festivals and to important dates like like marriage, like birth, like funerals. An Anglophile who binged on Bronte since she was a child, Regula has spent most of her food writing life focusing on British food. She's a consultant for the National Trust and she's even written the Downton Abbey Christmas cookbook. But in her latest book, Dark Rye and Honey Cake, she's going home to Belgium the long way. As she digs deep into the food of the ancient Dutch language Low Countries, she traces the influence of festival baking on the food culture in modern Belgium. I asked her why she turned her attention away from Britain. When Brexit happened, I felt like Britain has planted a knife in my back and I couldn't write about British culture or food any- anymore. And, and that's when I started thinking maybe it is time for me to return home. And home is a very, very emotional thing. It's, it's very vivid. So that's eight years ago. So I started collecting the old cookery books that I've done for, for my British research. I started collecting Dutch language cookbooks, German cookbooks, French cookbooks, Dutch cookbooks. And um, while I was doing that, I was forging a way home. And while I had been a stranger looking into British food, because I had turned my back at my own culture my, my entire life, because, I mean, I was an Anglophile and I didn't want to see anything in my country because I wasn't interested in it. Because also for me, it was clouded by politics here, which are very complicated, mm. which I talk about in the yeah. book as well. And I didn't want to see all of that. So essentially, I became a stranger to my own country, to my own culture. And when I realized that I was... That's the moment when I realized I could open the door to go back home. And book by book, story by story, I saw the good things. I saw the beautiful things like I saw them when I only saw the good things in Britain, you know what I mean? And I started seeing that there could be something to unite our country, which has three different language communities, which all exist very separately, very segregated. Yeah. And, and because I was a stranger now to my own culture, I, I could really grasp what the culture was all about. While otherwise, it's, it's under your nose. You don't see what's under your nose, basically. And I think that's really interesting because you talk about the geopolitics, but you focus on the festivals, on the joy, to represent a culture that's absolutely defined by the lack of joy, the, the bad things, the, the, the rupture. I've never looked at it like that. So it's really interesting that you say that. And, and, and maybe there is this kind of yin yang going on in the book, because of course I talk about the bad, I talk about the, the politics and the language segregation. In the heart of the low countries where people spoke either Flemish or Dutch, French or German, the ruling classes were speaking French, even though they actually were Flemish or they were German. They would all speak French, even though if they were Flemish, they were from Flanders or they were from, from the German part of the, or they were from the French part. The ruling classes all spoke French. Also, our law system was in French. So it just completely discriminated the Flemish people who could only speak Dutch or Flemish a really great example is these, these two men who were convicted. They were innocent, but they couldn't understand what the judge was saying. They couldn't understand what their lawyers were saying. So they got convicted and decapitated and they became martyrs for the Flemish cause, which became the Flemish movement, which at first was a cultural movement that eventually became a political movement, which has now become the far right. And all of that brought me such grief when I was a child, not understanding why I would go to Brussels or go to Wallonia and people not understanding what I was saying and not wanting to understand what I was saying. All of that, that really frustrated me, frustrated me as a child. But when I was researching the book for these eight years in my spare time while I was doing the other books, 
because that's what I do, researching. And if you want to go back for far enough in history, you'll see that all the sweet things are always, always connected to feasting and to festivals and to important dates like, like marriage, like birth, like funerals. So the whole feasting brought me all of these, these the memories that I have from my childhood also, the stories that I unearthed in manuscripts and, and, and in, in, in cookbooks and also in, in, in art. You, you know, there is, what something is really extraordinary in, in, in my part of the Low Countries is that if you look at art of the 16th and 17th and part of the 18th century, it, so many works are full of food. Yeah. So it, is, it, is, it must have been incredibly important to, to, to my region. And if you look at it, it's, if you look at the, the, the still lives of, of the 17th century, then you see that a lot of the food that's displayed is basically a PR campaign for the low countries. Baking, as you say, is, is, is very much part of the festivals. It's the performance of a country's identity, isn't it? It's the sort of the show. It's what you find at the fairs. And you say that baking traditions are the traditions that actually survive hard times and manage to remain relevant in a modern day and age. Is that the storytelling of a country that you're interested in? Or is it the actual identity that it reveals about Belgium now? I think it's, that's why I write books about baking mostly, even though I don't have a sweet tooth and I'm a judge on the Belgian Bake Off, I don't have a sweet tooth. Um, but if you look at culture and how it is today and how it used to be, it is the baking recipes that stand the test of time. And in the first place, that is because they are sweet and Humankind has always had a sweet tooth. So it's the sweet treats that, that stand the test of time because also they bring joy, they bring togetherness. And it, it, it already feels like a feast when you've got a cake in the middle of the table. It's very different from, from having a stew in the middle of the table. A cake just makes everyone happy and smiley. And, 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 and that's why those, those sweet treats get linked to those traditions and linked to those feasts. Because, of course, sugar, sugar was unaffordable for many centuries. So that's when only people could have sweet treats was on, on those feast days. And those occasions were something that people looked forward to. You know, once they started smelling the sweet spices in the in the air of the bakeries and they know like oh okay so it must be getting like uh time for saint nicholas or saint martin because they would yeah. smell it they would get the it, it's, it's the same thing for me when i was a child we would always receive a very large speculas figurine and and that would mean for me that okay winter is coming because i get this big figurine so it's almost saint nicholas so it, if you'd look at it back at your childhood when you aren't really aware of what time of of the year it is that those are the things that kind of settle it for you okay so i get this to eat so it must be that time well it's very interesting those food memories because i'm not sure and you'll probably know this more than i will that whether we have that in this country you know we'll go through your food moments in a minute but you talk in the same way uh, as sky mcalpine does and she's in venice she was just talking recently about carnivale she says that the longing those cakes that you have at this time of year in venice at the end of carnivale that's it. You won't have it until the next year. That creates those food memories. You know, we're talking right now in the beginning of Lent. We've just had Mardi Gras, Shrove Tuesday in, in Britain. Pancakes possibly are the only thing that we sniff up and smell and have that food memory, which we associate with a particular time of year. No, it's absolutely true. And that is because you are Protestant and we are Catholic. And, and that's, you know, the, if you look at British food history, it never, everything changed when, when Protestantism yeah. became the main uh, religion. And, and that's what the, basically tore apart the, the Netherlands because when it, the Reformation came, 
we were traditionally Catholic, but then Protestantism came and the, the north of the Netherlands, they, it became Protestant and we remained Catholic. And the, the, the Netherlands now still has the same problem as you in the UK have. They don't have the, a lot of these food traditions linked to festive days because they don't have the festive days anymore because in Protestantism, it isn't allowed to have those days because it's, it's too yeah. frivolous. And Catholicism is considered very frivolous. We are not very Catholic anymore. You know, we don't sit in church, but of course we just pick and choose and we think, okay, but we like, we like St. Nicholas. We like St. Martha. We like Christmas. We, we like that. We don't want to be in church every Sunday, but we'll just take the things that we like from religion and, and, and adopt it as our daily life, as our daily culture, which is not mainly a religious anymore. I can totally understand it, though, because fasting and feasting is about longing and joy. And it's about getting together and being with the people you love and having something in your calendar. Let's let's talk about uh, some of those traditions. Let's talk about waffles and possibly the one thing apart from beer and chips that we probably would associate oh, and chocolate, of course, with Belgium today. Tell us about waffles and why you chose them as your first food moment. So I've chosen the Brussels waffles as my first uh, food moment because that is a kind of waffle that also for me is connected to a, a, a time of year. And and it, it just told me, OK, there's a new year now when my mum and dad and I would go to this tea room in Antwerp, which was always too full, too smelly. We had to wait for a table. I hated it. But once we sat down and had a Brussels waffle, which is actually a Flemish waffle, but it was rebranded uh, when we were looking for our national identity, when Belgium uh, was uh, founded. A uh, little side note, which is also in the book. And we would sit down, we would have this thick Brussels waffle with cold cream and, and, and tons of icing sugar on it. And that would be for me, okay, the new year is starting. And it was like that for my mom, for my dad. And it is like that for me. But sadly, that tradition has waned in Belgium. It, it is something that people have forgotten about, that it is something to have for the new year. It's also because a lot of our tea rooms have disappeared. Our traditional tea rooms have disappeared. Um, which is a really sad thing, along with our cafes, which I've also written a book about, the disappearance of our traditional beer cafes. So we are losing a lot of our culture and our traditions. So so I, I thought, like, when I was doing this book, I hope people will start up these traditions again. And luckily, some of the people who have bought the book already said to me, in my own, cult, in my own country, in Belgium, said to me, we are going to start these traditions again because we had no idea that these were waffles for New Year and this was uh, a bread for that time of year and a biscuit for that time of year. We had no idea, but we are going to do this now with our children. So it, I'm hopeful that because of the book, that people will use it as a, as a guideline now to reinstate those food traditions and give it to their children as well so that their children would pass it on to their children and yeah. make change. I mean, it's the same as I was saying before, this performance of a country. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of people, Anna Roche uh, in Slovenia, Irina Georgescu in Romania. These are professional storytellers about their country by telling the story of, of its food. And it's incredibly important. And most importantly, it works. And that's really interesting. If you travel to the Peak District, where would you go? You would go to Bakewell to have a Bakewell pudding or a Bakewell tart. So it, it was to lure in people. But also it's the positive thing about tourism. It can have a ne negative thing because looking back at our, our waffle history, we have so many different waffles. But in the, in the US, you have the Belgian waffle and people are eating it standing in the streets which is not a proper thing to do. And then they come to Belgium and then they expect our waffle houses to serve them this same waffle standing in the street, which is not proper behavior. You should have that waffle eating in a tea room on a plate because it's very thick, it's full of icing sugar. And if you stand against a very strong wind, you'll be completely covered in sugar. So it makes sense that it, it, it's not the proper way of eating it. So it's like... Tourism has brought something really positive because it made a way for new food traditions, especially in, in Britain. But it also had this averse effect that people are expecting something when they visit these places. Like, for example, 
Bakewell. Bakewell is changing. The, the landscape of Bakewell tarts is changing because Bakewell tarts never used to have an iced top. But because Kipling started putting iced tops on Bakewell tarts, everyone now from abroad knows that a Bakewell tart looks like like a white thing, like a white iced top with like a cherry in the middle. It looks a little bit like a boob. And, and people go to Bakewell now, and instead of just expecting the Bakewell tart and the Bakewell pudding like they are, they are demanding a nice top and a cherry in the middle. And people, the bakeries, the bakeries in Bakewell are starting to offer iced Bakewells because of that. And in Belgium, the, the waffle houses are indeed offering waffles to eat standing <laughs> in the street. Your second food moment is the dark rye bread. It is the title of your book, Dark Rye and Honey Cake. But this is a very old tradition from, again, the low, low countries. How does that become a symbol of Belgium now? Well, it isn't a symbol for Belgium now because we now have different borders. And a food culture especially doesn't stop at borders and it doesn't change when borders change. And that's what's really frustrating. If I wanted to do this book and and because there was a time when we were thinking of, course, you know, making a Belgian baking book. But then it's very limited because Belgium isn't that old. And then you're limited to, limited to these borders. So that's why I chose the heart of the low countries, and which is Belgium and the border regions, because I can't separate the sticky dark rye bread from my culture because I know my grandmother and her mother and her mother's mother ate dark rye bread with this very stinky white Brussels cheese. So it is part of our culture. But if you look at it today, it's from a different country. It's from the Netherlands. Dark rye bread has always been associated with poverty, while today is associated with health food. So for me, it, it is something very positive because I was a very picky eater when I was a child. And my mom had a, a pack of the sticky dark rye bread in the cupboard. And she was like, oh, do you want to try this? She was completely like not believing that it, it would happen, that I would actually would go for that bread. But we always had this typical white, uh, white fresh cheese in the house as well. So I got the bread out and I spread it with the, the white cheese. And then we had some radishes and my mom sliced the radishes very thinly. It was beautiful, like white flesh, red coat. And I put them on, on the sandwich and it always looked like smorgasbord, you know, like, like Scandinavian open sandwiches. And in the summer I would have strawberries. And anything else I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't eat like, like basically I was a, a, a food snob as a child because I didn't, I would do, yeah, I didn't want to eat that, that supermarket loaf, which is really spongy, full of additives. I didn't want to eat that. I didn't want to eat the cheese or the ham that came out of this Tupperware, which was smelly. I didn't want to eat that. So I was like, oh my, yeah, I'll have some dark rye bread and some very fresh white cheese and radishes on top, please. Well, a trailblazer, and now look at its place in, in the culinary world. Your third food moment is um, the vlei, is yes. that how you pronounce it? And it very much is Belgian. You know, it comes from your birth town of Antwerp. Well, yeah, this this one does. So vlei is, of course, like you would say, pie or tart. Yeah. So it can be filled with... Uh, um, uh, fruit, fresh fruits, or it can fill, be, be, be the cheese filling. Um, but this particular one I chose is prune vlei, the prune tart, prune tart. And we eat this uh, prune tart for Ash Wednesday. So again, it's Catholic. And it's the last day of the carnival. Well, actually, the first, the, the first day of Lent, basically, when we would normally not eat anything sweet. But this comes because... Um, there used to be this type of, of, of soupy prune thing that people would eat on the first day of Lent. Because, of course, prunes are cleansing. If you're constipated, you'll just have some dried prunes and, and, and you'll be fine. So it makes sense to have that on the first day of Lent, to cleanse yourself before you start the fast. But that, of course, that custom got forgotten about. And while it was first this soupy prune thing, like like basically a kind of like a pudding baked into a pastry casing, probably without any butter, eggs or sugar, it's like this really tough medieval pastry, 
to keep it in because people didn't have vessels to eat from in the past. And then at a certain time when sugar became very cheap, sugar came into the mix. And because we are not very religious anymore, you got some eggs in the pastry now as well. So now we have this very rich prune tart. And nobody remembers why we eat it, but it does appear in our bakeries every year at Ash Wednesday, luckily, because otherwise people wouldn't remember. But luck strangely enough, when I gave a lecture last week, so many people from Antwerp were there and they were like, actually, we had no idea we eat prune tart for Ash Wednesday, but we do know that it certainly just appears in the shops. Yeah. I mean, you know, what's happening in this country, um, and I think pretty much all over the world, is people are becoming much more engaged with the stories behind the food that they eat. And the more storytelling that you bring to these wonderful dishes, the more people are going to eat them and seek them out and Instagram them. And then it all becomes a sort of self-fulfilling kind of story, doesn't it? People come to find the story, they eat the story, they tell the story. It's a fantastic way of creating an identity about a place. Tell us about how you're doing that with honey cake which is also in your title. Honey cake is peperkoek. It's the low country's gingerbread. But of course, because ginger isn't our main spice, it's not called gingerbread. And uh, in, 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 in the heart of the low countries, in the whole of the low, low countries, we we bake these types of gingerbreads. They, they can be loaf gingerbreads, they can be biscuit gingerbreads. But this particular one, the honey cake, is very special to me as well because it's the other thing I grew up on eating. So when I was thinking about the title, I wanted something, that I wanted to, to, to highlight the bakes that really were the backbone of my childhood, backbone of me growing up. And honey cake has this really old history. Of course, in every culture, it has an old history because... It is connected to all the feasts. I mean, the, the, the honey cake, the, pe and the whole of the gingerbread uh, array comes around the time when St. Nicholas arrives in town here. It is the Christmas period. It is that time when we need the warmth of the spices and in the, in the smell of the air and, and, and eating them and warming up. And it's also um, something that was uh, used as a marriage proposal. So a young fellow would arrive at a girl's house with a honey cake and she would sometimes even wrap it around her arm and they would go around the village fair and everyone would see that she would have the gingerbread wrapped around her arm and people would go like, oh, they're courting. But then at the end of the fair... There was this time when the fella had to go back to the house of, of the girl he was courting. And then the, the, the honey cake was on the table. I don't know how fresh it was by then, but it was on the table. And if the father would slice off a slice and give it to the young guy, then there would be a, a wedding. And if he would receive the entire cake back, then he would just be on his way and had to wait for the next fair to, uh, to court another girl. So that was really important. But it was also baked for funerals, for, 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 the, for, for births, for weddings. So it's a very, very important cake for, for our tradition. And of course, we have them in all sizes and shapes. And some are very brittle. Some are very, very, very extremely tough. Uh, I mean, the earliest ones were just made with um, honey and and honey and and flour, so that turns into an incredibly rock hard honey cake, which was by the villagers of Dinant in Wallonia, was used to throw at the enemy in the Middle Ages to warm them off, and that became the Cook de Dinant, which still exists today. So it is very entwined with our culture and our history. Yeah, of course. Because it's become a performance of itself. It's, and that's the story that is being circulated. When we first started talking, we were talking about the ruptures in, in Belgium and the, the low countries and that lack of identity. Can this food story bring people together? Can it form a national identity that feels real? Yeah, I think so. I hope, and that was my wish, that the book would be translated into French because, of course, and German, because, of course, we've got a French language community, we've got a German language community in my country, and we don't overlap. People mistakenly assume that Belgians are trilingual, but we are not. I do speak German, but I don't speak French because 
I just learned Germanic languages much, e much more easily. I mean, I thought myself English while reading Jane Austen when I, when I was about 10 years old. So it, it, it just comes naturally to me. I taught myself German by looking at German television shows, like children's television shows when I was about four years old. So it comes natural to me, but French, it never did. So we don't, we don't have a way to communicate. And I was hoping that this book would become a bridge between us so we could see that even though we stay in our own region most, most of the time, that if we do venture out and we look at the bakeries especially, we will find the same types of fly or pies and the same type of, of pepper cook or, or honey cakes. And we will see that we are one people, that those borders that were there geographically were suddenly language borders and that we can go across those borders. We do not have to stay in our own region. We can come together, even though we, if we not understand each other language-wise, we can have the same honey cake and the same prune pie. We can, we can come together and we can understand that what actually drives us apart is not the differences that we think we have. It's the politicians who like to keep us separated because... If you if you create the create division then you rule. Thanks for listening. Do follow me on Instagram. I'm at Food Chili Smith and you can also find a little surprise every week on Substack as I ask my guests for a little extra bite. Just search for Chili Smith on Substack and I'll see you next week.